Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer, lone and tempest-tossed. No storms can hide that radiance peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Hi, and welcome to the Rustin Church of Christ. My name is Jonathan Long. I am the minister here at the Rustin Church, and we have been studying for the last, uh, starting last week, we started studying uh, discipleship and what it means for us to be a New Testament disciple. And we've been following along um, a book called Building a Discipling Culture by Mike Breen and, and Steve Cockrum. And those two gentlemen wrote a, a fantastic book over at 3DM Ministries. And uh, it deals with how they, as a group, work and with church leadership and with churches to build discipling churches, how to build churches that follow the pattern that, that God had for us in the Great Commission to go out and to make disciples and to teach them and how we engage one another in our real personal lives to teach one another what it's like to be like Christ. And so that's what we are studying today. We're going to be looking at the second part of the study, which is continuous growth. Before we get started, though, uh, you would really help us a whole lot if you would uh, like or subscribe, uh, comment, interact with our videos. That's the very best way that YouTube, YouTube's algorithms will put our content out to more people is if you'll interact with our videos. Uh, so we'd really, really appreciate it. If you have a question, please put it down in the comments below, and, and we'll check them, and, and we'd love to, to interact with you that way. But we're going to start, we're going to talk about continuous growth. And this is a portion that they talk about, and it's based, they base this portion out of Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. In Mark uh, chapter 1 and verse 15, Jesus has just received the news that John the Baptist uh, was put into prison. And he says that the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And, and they really make a, an interesting observation in that word, uh, the time, the word for time there. You know, we can use lots of different words for time, or time represents lots of different things for you and I today. Most of the time, whenever we talk about time, we think about this linear construct uh, that is held together in the past, the present, and the future. And, and that would be chronos time. They had a word for that. It was chronos. And, and so that's what they would use to represent a linear uh, analogy of time, if you will. But then sometimes we use time, we, we say, oh, do you remember that time when we went to such and such? And, it, and we use the word time to represent an event. And that word that they would have used then in the Koine Greek is uh, kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S. And that's the term that is used here in Mark chapter 1. It says that the kairos, the, the time of an event, is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And Mike Breen and Steve Cockrum have used that as a basis for a, a form of discipleship that we should use, a pattern that we should be practicing. And it's really, really genius stuff. They say that all throughout our lives that we enter these kairos moments, these events, these special events that, uh, that we have that can impact us. And we have choices to stop at events and to learn from them and to build and to grow from them, or we can just continue on through events and, and remain relatively unchanged. And that the life of a disciple should be marked by several of these Kairos events where we are stopping and we're trying to see what God is teaching us in those events, and we reflect and then we prepare for actions from that. And so they take this, this Mark chapter 115, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. For Jesus at that moment, he was saying, there is an event that is happening right now, and God's kingdom is coming near to man. And in our lives, we look at events, these Kairos events, where God's kingdom is coming nearer to our lives. He's trying to show us more about our lives or show us more about him in our lives. And so in these Kairos, we need to be able to recognize 
what we're doing there. And then we need to repent and believe in those events so that we can uh, have a proper response and growth to make us more like Jesus. You know, we, we face these situations all the time, whether it's a struggle, uh, so maybe it could be the loss of a loved one, maybe it could be a wedding, uh, maybe it could be a celebration, it could be a painful event, an exciting event. But we interact with these moments all the time that we could use to change our lives and to improve on ourselves, to, be, to examine ourselves and become more like the pattern of Christ if we're careful. And so that's what Jesus was commanding them to do, that there are certain times when God draws near, you should repent. The word for repent there means metanoia. It means a changing of your mind. You think differently about the thing than you did before. And then to believe, the word for belief there is pistis. It's the same word that is used for faith and faithfulness. He's, so when we come into these moments, we, we should work to have a change of mind and then a pistis, a, a faithful change of action in our lives. And, and they go... They go through this process. They say that when we repent, part of the process of repentance, they have a threefold uh, process of repentance, is that you should observe, you should reflect, and you should discuss what occurs. When we, if we're careful, if we stop and we recognize moments in our life that are important that we think that we could learn from, first thing we need to do is we need to stop and we need to observe whether what's going on, actually take inventory of the situation. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 says that we're supposed to be sober and vigilant. I mean, we're supposed to be watchful because okay? the devil's walking around looking for opportunities to devour us. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13 says that we should watch and stand fast in the faith. Being watchful is something that a, a New Testament Christian, a disciple, is supposed to be doing. And so we should be observing, we should be looking around for these opportunities. But when they happen, we should stop and, and reflect and see what actually occurred. Take some inventory of what happened. So then secondly, we, we observe, we see what happened, then we actually reflect. We, we contemplate the events, how we got there, what exactly happened. Then the third wheel of that is discuss. The third spoke in that wheel of repentance is to discuss it. You know, so many times in our lives we, we have an events that happen, important events, things that could change our lives, but we'll sit quietly on them. We won't actually mention what happens. And, and we especially don't want to mention them to somebody else because then somebody might know where I've had a moment of struggle or weakness or pain. It would be very helpful for us in repentance and changing our mind if we would look in our lives and if we would discuss and talk with our brothers and sisters about what actually just happened, allow them to share in some of that because it protects us from becoming hardened. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 says to exhort one another daily why it's today lest any of you should be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 that we're not supposed to have evil speech come out of our mouths but only what is good for edification. Colossians 3 16 the, the word of Christ should dwell in us richly so that we can teach and admonish one another and, and lift one another up. We should be talking about things as part of renewing our mind, changing our mind about a topic. You know, we can experience something, we, we observe it, we know what's wrong, but when we don't deal with it directly, we kind of try to side skirt it and we don't actually resolve to a substantial change of mind about something. It's hard to avoid the, the truths in our lives and especially the truths about the sin in our lives whenever we're having an open discussion with somebody else, when we put it out into the universe, um, if you will, we can't hide from it then. So when we repent, we observe, we reflect, and we discuss. But then Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8, Jesus says that we should bring fruits that are meat for repentance. There should be something that follows a change of mind. You know, a change of mind always results in a change of action because so many people think about it, they ponder it, and then they go right back to their life and they continue on with their lives and they're unchanged. But Matthew 3, 8 says that we should have fruit that represents that repentance. And again, we're talking about belief. This Mark 1, 15 said the time, the, the kairos is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe. You know, there are some that teach, I think of Stephen Anderson, who's this King James Von King James Version only preacher out of, I think maybe, uh, I think he's in Tempe, Arizona. And he just screams and he yells and he preaches that anything other than a belief of heart is blasphemy. 
and he says that no action is faith and that only belief in Jesus Christ is, is the only repentance and the only action that needs to take place. You don't have to stop sinning in your life. And that, that's a terrible false doctrine. The way that the Koine Greek reads pistis is faith or faithfulness, it means a, a change, uh, a, a belief in something such that your life is changed. And, and we're going to look at that in a little bit. But there are three spokes that these two men bring up in their book, Building a Discipling Culture, under the belief wheel, if you will. The first one is if you're going to believe, if you're going to take action, faithful action, then you need a plan. In Proverbs 21, verse 5 says, The plans of the diligent surely, uh, or lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. We don't want to rush into things too quickly. We want to be careful to plan out the things that we do. You know, I've built a, a, a lean-to to cover my lawnmower so that it would get out of the rain the other day. And I went through and I planned out my materials and, and I measured everything. But one of the things I didn't do is I didn't plan for uh, that building being a little bit out of square. And so when I got ready to put my sheet metal up, I, I rocked on some assumptions. And so I've got a little one-inch overhang on, on two of my pieces of tin. I didn't like that. I didn't plan as much as I should. I got a little hasty. We need to plan for action whenever we're repenting and believing, when we experience these moments for learning in our lives. Second thing under belief is that we should be held accountable. There should be accountability. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 15, Paul tells the church there that they should rejoice with those that rejoice and that they should weep with those that weep. And, and what a beautiful moment uh, that it is whenever we share the types of relationships that we can share in each other's joys and pains. And then we plan, we account, and then we act. In the book of James, chapter 2, the entire chapter deals with faithfulness that is demonstrated in action. And he is going against, he is railing against the idea that you can just live in faith. What Stephen Anderson would proclaim, that it's just a belief James, from verse 14 through the end of the chapter, he, he says over and over and over again that faith without works is dead, that if you'll show me uh, that I will show you my faith by my works. He says that by Rahab the harlot and what she did, we see that a person is justified by their works, not only by their faith. And he is contrasting there just a mind only versus an action. And so for you and I, as we look at our lives, we need to be aware, be vigilant about moments that we're interacting with where God may be trying to teach us something, significant moments. Don't let our life just pass by and we're so numb to the events that are going on because we're seeking some worldly pleasure. We're seeking some empty emptiness that's inside us. We're seeking to fill that with the pleasures of this world. We need to be looking for moments to grow, where things that we can repent of, change our mind about, things that we can then when we have a change of mind, we can change our action. We can become more like Christ. Because ultimately that's our goal, is to be more like Jesus and to make more men that are like Jesus. I hope that's your goal. Uh, again, we're thankful for you joining with us, following along with us. Uh, if you would, please give us a like, subscribe, share. It's free to you. It means a lot to us. We'll see you again next time. Until then.